Hi, I'm Mark from GK Tutor. In this video, I'm going to talk about puncture tapes. Now, this is how we used to store information back in the day. When I first got into engineering in 1991, we still had a lot of punch tape machines. So quite often, we would feed our programs in by hand, and if the program needed editing, we'd have to throw away the tape and make a new one. So how does this punch tape work? Well, we've got two different examples here. We've got five tape and we've got an eight hole tape. So the five hole tape holds 32 characters and the eight hole tape holds 256 characters. So with the eight hole tape, we can store a lot more characters and different kinds of information. So at the front of our punch tape, we normally see an arrow so we know which way to feed the tape into, plus some header information so we know what the program is and any other information we may need to store about it. But I can't really talk about storage of programming without speaking about this lady. This is Margaret Hamilton. Now Margaret and her team famously wrote the Apollo Guidance Computer source code. And that's what she stood next to here in this picture. But what we're looking at there is 3.6 miles of code. She also coins the term software engineering, by the way. So what's Margaret Hamilton got to do with punch tapes? Well, once her and her team wrote this 3.6 miles of code, they gave it to a team to turn it into punch tapes so they could upload it to the computers. Now, out of interest, this team was called LOL, Little Old Ladies, because it was normally Little Old Ladies that converted the program into punch tapes. So how do these punch tapes work? Well, let's have a quick look. So this top line here, this represents the numbered rows and it's numbered backwards. And this line here, this uh, circles down here, it's one right here. This is used to feed the tape into the machine. So there'd be a little wheel with pins that would feed in through these holes as it goes up. And lights would go through these points here and be read behind the tape with a light sensor. And these holes here represent closed holes. And if they were open, I'm gonna draw them in black like that. So if the lights hit this hole here, it would go through and it would represent one in this column. So how does these columns work and how does it know what code is what just by a few dots? Well, so instead of writing channel numbers across the top here, I've wrote what numbers they are representing with this here. So if, for example, we have an open hole in this position, the machine will read that as one. And on this line, if we shade in these two, the machine will add one to two, so that would be three. So for example, nine would be an eight plus one, and that would be nine. So that's how the machines read the numbers from these. And if you've ever worked in binary, you probably realized this is the base two binary system. So there's two different standards of tapes we used to work to. There's EIA, also known as BCD, and ASCII, which is known as ISO. So if we laid them out looking like this, they look exactly the same, but they're actually two separate systems. Now the binary numbers that we just discussed work the same. So a uh, hole here, for example, would still be one in EIA as well as ASCIL. Now the machine operator would need to identify which tape he had in his hands. Now this is actually rather easy to do because all the EIA system tapes would have an odds number of holes and all of the ASCII tapes would have an even number. Oh, my writing is absolutely terrible. There we go, that'll do. So under EIA, for example, if we had one, that would be fine. But if we had three, that would be an even number. So we would then add a hole under the five column to make that odd. So we can tell just by looking at one row of numbers if it's odd or even, so we know which tape is which. Now the reason this is done this way is so the tape reader will know straight away if there's an error. So it can quite easily know if each line is an odd or even number. And if we're running ASCII tape and the machine reader suddenly sees an odd number, an odd row of holes on a line, it knows there's been an error. So it will stop the machine and alert the operator saying a tape read error. So that's how the machine very easily can tell which tape is which and also spot errors. Now just out of interest, if we have an odds number on an even um, tape on our ASCII, we would add a hole 
into number eight, row eight, to make that even. Whereas EIA, we would add a hole into row five. So there's always an odd number of holes on each row. So here I've added holes for numbers zero to nine and also G and M. So we can see the difference that letters make here. So letters get a little bit more complicated and it does change between system and system. So just for clarity with the letters, if you're familiar with the ASCII system, where on some keyboards, we don't have all the characters on the computer keyboard. So we would use alt and then a series of numbers to get a character that's not usually on our keyboards. So it works the same way. It would use a system of holes to represent each letter. So that's basically how paper tapes work. Now, luckily machinists never had to read these paper tapes, but some of the guys that's run the machines for years started to get a bit of a feel and quite a few could actually read these by eye as they scanned over them and make adjustments. Now, editing to a paper tape was normally done by literally cutting and pasting. We would cut a line and then tape the second bit of tape to it with the new holes in if we were just doing quick edits. But cutting and pasting in this method generally caused errors because the positions of the holes have got to be exact. So if we were going to write G01 in ISO, it would look like this. So we can see here on the one line, we have our one highlighted there and the rest of the numbers are empty. So that displays a one. And we're also punching a hole on channels five and six as well. And but because that would be an odd number, we then punch a hole on column eight and that would give us an even number. So the machine would be happy that it is in fact ISO and not EIA format. So these numbers listed along the top here is our channel numbers and not like the slide I showed just now, which the numbers represented the numerical values of punched holes. So interestingly, each one of these holes represents one bit and an entire line represents a byte. So what we have here is we're reading eight bits per line or per byte. So when we talk about kilobytes or terabytes, you can imagine how much data we would have to store on a paper tape to hit those kind of storage capacities. So I like to use examples of paper tape when describing the difference between low level and high level programming. Now, the writing G code is classed as a high level programming language because it converts into zeros and ones that the machine's CPU can read. Now, a CPU is used to seeing on or off or zeros and ones as its data goes through the processor, but we don't program that way. That's classed as a low level programming language or machine code. Now we use high level programming languages such as G code and the machine converts that into noughts or ones for us so the computer can read it. So going back to punch tapes, it's a very good way of visualizing what our code works like in this day and age. So as we type in GO1 into our program, the computer actually reads a series of ones and zeros or ons and offs to be able to convert this so the machine can read it in the processor in the CPU. So that's a little bit about punch tapes. So I'll be interested to know if any of you still use punch tapes in your day to day while you're working in a machine shop.